Ten miles off the coast of New Hampshire lie the Isles of Shoals. European fishermen ventured to the islands in the 1500s. In 1616, the famous John Smith wrote of the Isles of Shoals, And of all four parts of the world that I have seen not inhabited, could I have the means to transport a colony, I would rather live here than anywhere. Smith was so impressed with the islands, he named them Smith's Islands. However, they'd been called the Isles of Shoals long before Smith arrived in 1614. Samuel Champlain was the first to mention the islands in a journal in 1605. During the 1600s, the Isles of Shoals had become an important fishing and trading center of northern New England. First settlers in New Hampshire really came as fishermen. Uh, they didn't actually come as settlers, they probably came as in, maybe as indentured workers and they, they came to catch the codfish. As we know, the codfish was, uh, was the king in this area. There was so much cod in the ocean that you could lower a basket down off your ship and bring the basket up and it was full of cod. And they thought it was a miracle. Cod was so plentiful that many believe the name of the islands is a reference to the number of schools, or shoals, of fish. When shoalers caught the cod, they would split it open and salt it, making it a superior quality. The fish became known as dunfish. They actually filleted the fish, put them in salt water, and then laid them out and sun-dried them and, rever and did followed this process several times, and the fish would turn a sherry red, and the taste, the salt taste, increased accordingly. About 100% of the uh, market for the Isles of Shoals fishmongers went to Europe, because they could get about, in Europe, about 15% more than the uh, and, and regular fish. So the dun fish was a uh, exotic, exotic product in, in Europe at the time. In March 1635, Richard Dummer and John Spencer came round Hampton River in their shallop at what is known as the Landing and were very impressed by the location. Dummer, who was a member of the General Court of Massachusetts, had the court lay its claim to the section for a plantation there. First called the plantation at Winnicott, an Abenaki word meaning pleasant pines, Hampton was one of four original New Hampshire townships, the only one charted by the General Court of Massachusetts. The other towns, Exeter, Dover, and Strawberry Bank, which later became Portsmouth, would come under Massachusetts authority a few years later. Hampton was settled in 1638 by a group of parishioners led by the Reverend Stephen Batchelor who had formerly preached at the settlement's namesake, Hampton, England. Incorporated in 1639, the township originally included the seacoast towns of Hampton Falls, Northampton, parts of Rye, and Seabrook. This is the story of flats, shacks, and claws, of how the settlers along the coast of New Hampshire found their livelihood as fishermen who harvested clams from the flats, stored their boats in shacks, and captured the delicacy of the lobster's claw. Digging clams is one of the oldest activities to be conducted in the Hampton and Seabrook area. Native Americans, they came to uh, Hampton River primarily for the shellfish. The clamming was right from the beginning. When the Indians, the Native Indians, lived along here, they actually used to uh, dig the clams, boil them, because they were, they were uh, easy, easy to prepare and you could put a lot of, lot of them in a small area and it would sustain them during the winter. <laughs> 
Piles of clamshells generated by Native Americans and early settlers have been uncovered adjacent to the marsh creeks in Hampton, Seabrook, and Hampton Falls. When the Native Americans dug the clams, they took the clamshells and put them in heaps. And some of these heaps would run a half mile long, maybe 10 feet wide and eight or nine feet deep. During the 1800s, clams dug from the flats in Hampton and Seabrook Harbor contributed to the local diet. The early clam markets were the hotels and restaurants of the beaches. And while some people dug clams commercially, the industry has traditionally been based in Seabrook, which has the largest clam flats. There were several big places that, that one would dig down there. There was Common Island and something called the Middle Ground, and every, everybody that dug clams knew, all, knew where all these places were. There were flats in the region of the Willows, and turning right past Common Island and going up Seabrook Flats, we came to the site. Mr. Beckman, who was 85 at the time, wore rubber boots and trudged a quarter of a mile, much of the time through deep, heavy, muddy flats. He did not stop for breath or rest until he reached a spot where he started to dig. I also recall how his fingers were worn as he shoveled up from the bottom of his wagon the peck or half peck of clams. Old Chase, the clam man of Seabrook, used to drive up through Kensington with a little black horse, stopping at every home. This was about 1880. Roland Sawyer. Originally, each town owned and controlled their respective clam flats, but for many years, digging was unregulated. They were open to all. I don't think you could own any of those. Most of those would have been uh, considered public lands, and so you could go in and dig wherever you wanted to dig. And There were people that would know a certain place where there would be a, a, a good amount of clams. Anybody could dig clams. Uh, you could dig any amount you wanted to then, and there was commercial digging being done there too. Uh, but a lot of people just did it recreational, you know, to get a meal of clams. Digging clams was an activity shared by families and people of all ages. I used to go clam with my father growing up back in, oh, the late 30s and 40s. And I was probably about four years old. He. Go down, we'd go down back of where we lived there, down what we call Coles Creek area, and uh, I'd walk down with him, of course, but, and he'd dig his clams, and when we come back, I'd get tired, so he'd put me on his shoulders and carry me on his shoulders, and he'd lug his bucket and his digger, you know, like this, but he'd always let me, and I'd ride up on his shoulders, because it, it was quite a hike, you know. My grandfather uh, wound up being a clam digger. And during the Depression, that's the way he supported the family, was by digging clams. And he would ride his bicycle down to the marsh, and I guess he probably had a, had a boat down there, or maybe he just walked out on the, on the marsh at low tide, and he would dig uh, several bushels of clams, and his mother would hitch up the horse and wagon and, and, and drive down to, the, to the, probably the like, farm lane dock, perhaps. and. Uh, Load the, load the clams on the wagon and they'd go back home and the family would sit around and chuck the clams at night if that's when the tide was. And he'd be up half the night washing the clams. He'd put the clams in little boxes and he made a little, uh, little trays with a little sort of a carrying thing to put rows of boxes in there. And he would take the train to Portsmouth and go door to door and sell clams down there. And he'd get enough money to buy some, some food and they'd come back home again and he'd go clam digging after that, day after day after day. Clam diggers had to be very aware of the tides. Well, the only way, you know, the only way you could dig was at low tide. You could, you could start digging as soon as the flats started to show. You go up to the clam flats, uh, you take your, your bucket, which is, has to be, a, can't be over a certain size because there's a uh, limit as to how many clams you can have, and you take your clam digger, which is uh, that what's actually allowed here is called an Ipswich digger, and it looks like a uh, looks like a four 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 tines four tines with a handle angled, and that's what you 
dig into the clam flat with. The thing to do was to, to find a place where there would be, where they were, the holes were plentiful, and then you would take your digger and you'd go down in front of them, and then you'd go down each side, and then you'd go back to the front and you'd take your digger and bring that up, and you'd bring up a big chunk of the mud, you know, or the sand. It would come up. It was, uh, it was an easy work, and I wouldn't attempt it now. That's, uh, and my family never, you, you'll see some people on different photos or whatever, They'll be on their hands and knees digging. No, 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 no. Um, you were just bent over. And then the clams would be right there, and you could just pick them off like that and put them in your bucket. I've, I've taken this, God, 20, 25 clams out of just one spot, you know? Once the clams were dug, they were brought back to clam shacks, where they would be pried open. Using a special knife, the clams would be removed or shucked from their shells. This process could be dangerous. You get hurt. I mean, you could you could slip with a knife and cut yourself. And I mean, the shells are sharp. You you come down through with your knife, take off the first shell, and then you go down through and take the clam out of the sh second shell, cut the head, and pull the string. During the 1800s, many clam shacks lined the southern part of Seabrook Harbor, and at one time, the town had between 80 to 100 people employed as clam shuckers, many of them being women. After reaching beyond the Long Bridge, then stood several shanties, before which men would shuck for sale bushels of clams dug at low tide. Seabrook's champion clam digger was Bub Gove. A husky man, he would dig four or five bushels on a tide, and then on a wheelbarrow, wheel them to the beach hotels. Others would dig, take them to the clam shanties, and shuck for sale. Every turnover of a section of flat, or about eight or nine inches square, would enable one to pick from the overturned chunk of sand anywhere from 10 to 20 clams. Thus, to dig a bushel, it did not take a husky man long. Later, the men turned over most of the shucking to the women folks, and the line of shanties were partly of each sex. Never a spot where the female population was so useful in so many ways as the women of Seabrook. Roland Sawyer. Clams were not the only resource found in the harbors of Seabrook and Hampton. These harbors and the Hampton River was filled with fish. On January 17, 1656, in Hampton, a boat was passed appropriating Sargent's Island in the Hampton River to the use of the fishermen of Hampton for the purpose of building stages and curing fish. This is where they would actually fish uh, in that area uh, because the, uh, uh, f the fish would actually go, uh, go in there and upriver. From what I have understood, that's always been a uh, a safe harbor and a good fishing area. Hampton River empties into the Hampton Seabrook Harbor. Navigating the river's mouth where it leads into the Atlantic Ocean was challenging due to the rough and swift currents, sandbars, and rock ledges. Hampton River was not particularly conducive to fishing anyway because you'd have to go a long way to get out to the ocean and in those days you either would be trying to sail or row and it just wasn't an easy thing to do. Real respectable current in the uh, uh, Hampton River and, and, and passing through that that entrance is, can be pretty dicey at times, it, it really is. Our rocks right at the mouth of our harbor, there's inner sunk rocks and outer sunk rocks. The inner one's a line of rocks that runs from the kind of the outside of the harbor up to the northeast about, oh, I don't know, three or four hundred yards. And then there's a break, and then there's the outer sunk rocks. The highest rock of those rocks is called North High Rock. Many tragedies occurred at the harbor's mouth. Perhaps the most famous was the wreck of the Shallop River Mouth in the autumn of 1657 having on board four men, two women, 
and two children. Eight persons in all, settlers of the town of Hampton. The original shipwreck report read, the 20th of the eighth month, 1657. The sad hand of God upon eight persons going in a small vessel by sea from Hampton to Boston, who were all swallowed up in the ocean soon after they were out of the harbor, all drowned. Two centuries later, John Greenleaf Whittier recalls the tragedy in his poem, Wreck of the Rivermouth. Solemn it was in that old day, in Hampton Town and its log-built church, where side by side the coffins lay, and the mourners stood in aisle and porch. In the singing seat, young eyes were dim, the voices faltered that raised the hymn. And Father Dalton, grave and stern, sobbed through his prayer and wept in turn. Hampton fishermen would search for safer locations to launch their boats, allowing them to avoid the harbor's mouth, the treacherous ledges, sandbars, and swift currents. By 1800, many Hampton fishermen and lobstermen had moved away from the Hampton River and Sargent's Island, relocating to what was called the Cove at Hampton's North Beach. Town freemen who got permission from the town would build fish houses along this strip, and they were to have free and tax-free access to this land if they used it for fishing purposes and they would be allowed to build a structure for their livelihood or endeavor, which we would call a fish house. The 1806 map of Hampton shows the drawings of 20 fish houses. At North Beach's Cove, Fishermen built their rude fish shacks to hold their dories, lobster traps, and fishing gear. In the age of sail and row, this site presented an easier and safer access to fishing grounds and the Isles of Shoals, avoiding the dangerous mouth of the Hampton River. Slightly to the north of the cove is Little Boar's Head in Northampton. Here fishermen and lobstermen constructed fish houses as well. We know that in 1804, there were fish houses here. In the first map of this area, which is 1857, the fish houses appear, and the, there are 10 or so on that map. Like the cove at North Beach, the cove of Little Boy's Head suited the fishermen and lobstermen's needs. For these fish houses right here, these fish houses are on um, a very U-shaped cove. And this cove allows storms and big waves to come in on the eastern tucked up side of this cove. Protected from a northeast storm are these fish houses, and they survived 200 years. To the south of Little Boar's Head in Place Cove was yet another location where fishermen and lobstermen built their shacks. Located between the Hampton River and Place Cove, is a strip of land jetting into the Atlantic Ocean called Great Boar's Head. On the head's south side foot, ambitious fishermen and lobstermen built their fish houses. The fish houses of Boar's Head, on the south side of Boar's Head, uh, access to them were by what the fishermen back then called a uh, hundred steps to the fish houses. And it was a set of steps that came from the top of Boar's Head all the way down the side, right to the fish houses. As far as I know, the, the fishermen built them. The fishermen that used them built them. Uh, one of the fishermen was my great-grandfather, who, who was Joseph Nudd. In 1871, Will S. Vedum recalls Great Boar's Head. On the south side of the head, almost out to the point, there was a long flight of stairs going down to the water's edge. Mr. Nudd's fishing house was located there. Mr. Nudd was a fisherman who also took out fishing parties. With their fish houses, established fishermen and lobstermen were ready to launch dory boats from the fish houses into the Atlantic Ocean. Out of the front, the dory would go on wooden rollers, uh, small but effective and quite rounded 
uh, uh, tree limbs that were used under the boats to provide movement. And the fishermen would move the dory half a length, take the piece out from the back, put it in the front, move it over the next half of the length, take the piece all the way over the sand and down to the water. The Hampton Dory Boat was a popular choice among fishermen and lobstermen along the New Hampshire seacoast. Enoch Chase of Seabrook invented the boat, which was referred to by many names, such as the Hampton Boat, Hampton Whaler, and the Hampton Dory. The Hampton Summer Whaleboat Dory was 19 feet long on the keel, 7 feet wide, and 3 feet deep. Basically what it was was a large dory, and the idea is that if two men went out as far as the Isles of Shoals in rough uh, water, one could stand and row, and the other could stand and catch the fish. And it is said that with all the waves slapping it and pushing it around, uh, it literally would not sink. So that the Hampton Beach Dory uh, is an offshoot of the uh, Hampton Fish House era. During the winter, the Hampton Dories or whale boats were replaced with the Hampton Wherries. Similar to the whale boats in shape and of the same build, but intended for rowing though having a sail for fishing when the wind was cooperative. The wherry boat was managed by two men. One man took the oars to keep the boat from drifting away from the fishing ground, while the other managed the hand lines, turning from one to the other as fast as he could haul and take off the fish and rebate the hook. During the winter, both the caught fish and fish lines would freeze as soon as it was taken out of the water due to the frigid air and water temperatures. During the winter, the, the Atlantic Ocean can be a terrible place. In the winter time, when, when icing is a re real serious problem, and one thing is that I think that's misunderstood is a lot of people think salt water just doesn't freeze. Well, it certainly does, and that's a matter of fact. And, and, but when it begins to catch on, on, a, on a surface, it, it, it simply provides more and more weight, just plain sheer pounds of weight. And, uh, and has a real serious effect on the stability of the boat, so that when you, when you get to a certain level of weight, then the boat's going to become unstable and either roll over, sometimes it'll sink, just plain, you know, go right straight down, depending upon the weight that's applied to it. Many times the fishermen and lobstermen were forced to row and pound off the all-encasing ice for hours before reaching shore. In 1899, Thomas Levitt wrote, In Hampton, many men went fishing in the winter to get money to pay their taxes with and to eke out a living. It was a hazardous business and was often accompanied with great exposure, hardship, and danger. It behooved men who went out five or six miles from the shore in winter in a rowboat fitted with one little sail. To them, starting before daylight, the appearance of the stars and the clouds and the cry of the sea meant much. For if these signs were not heeded or understood, they might be caught far off in the dreaded snow squall. Marston and Moulton took a notion to go out fishing one morning and went to Boar's Head and from there to the fishing grounds. There were many boats out there that day, scattered over an area of four or five miles. The wind started up from the northeast in the afternoon and the sea made very fast, faster than the oldest fishermen had ever known it to do. The fishing was good, and the men in several of the boats, not realizing that the sea would be increased during the time it would take them to make the distance to shore, held on longer than it was prudent and came near being swamped. The men in the last boat to arrive ashore stated that they had seen Marston and Moulton apparently getting ready to start, and that was all. Marston and Moulton were never seen afterwards, and their boat was found on the Ipswich beach. Winter fishermen and lobstermen aimed to reach the fishing grounds as soon as it was light enough in the morning to see landmarks for position and navigation. These landmarks were so important that in 1825, a group of fishermen and lobstermen 
paid Martha Jeunesse of Rye, New Hampshire, who owned the land at Breakfast Hill, to preserve a clump of pine trees used by fishermen and lobstermen as their landmark. The deed reads, We the said John Moulton and Jonathan Levitt of Hampton, David Brown of Northampton, and Ephraim Philbrick of Rye, aforesaid gentlemen, do hereby disclose and make known that the consideration sum of one hundred dollars paid to the said Martha Jenis for the purpose of keeping a landmark on said premises by the trees now standing thereon, or for the purpose of erecting a monument or beacon as a landmark for the use of fishermen and navigators in marking the coast and ascertaining their situation in the bay or on the sea, in fishing or navigating their boats or vessels. In witness whereof we have hereunto set our hands and seals this day on March in the year of our Lord, 1825. After overcoming harsh weather and treacherous obstacles, fishermen and lobstermen would head for shore where their efforts would be rewarded. In the early 1800s, fishmongers, or middlemen, bought fish directly from the fishermen and sold the catch to a variety of people and places. Now one thing about the uh, fishermen who actually fished in this area, who was their largest uh, customer? They were the so-called, I'll call them, cattle drovers from, uh, from their businessmen, from Vermont, Maine, and even Massachusetts. What they would do is during the winter, they would actually drive their cattle, sometimes sheep, to the seacoast where they could be sold for profit. During the New England winters, these fishmongers and their teams of horses and cattle needed temporary shelter as they waited for the fishermen to return from sea. In 1804, the first inn on the beach was built on Hampton's North Beach. Moses Levitt and his wife purchased the dwelling on Nut Island just behind the fish houses and turned the building into a place of service for fish buyers and fishmongers. The Levitt, Moses Levitt uh, Hotel, which goes way back to about 1800, uh, 200 yards in back uh, or to the west of the fish houses was where they would stay. And Moses Levitt had a huge barn, it still stands today and that is where the uh, cattle were stored until they were sold. Moses Levitt and his wife, famous as one of the best cooks, which was perhaps the reason that the Levitt house was so well patronized, not only provided food and drink to the Vermont and Canadian fishmongers, but provided stables for their teams of horse-drawn wagons. In 1913, Harry Alden Johnson of Haverhill, Massachusetts recalls, For several decades, the first Levitt House was patronized by the fishermen who annually came down over the road from Vermont to return with loads of frozen mackerel, cod, and other fish which the beach residents had caught and cured. The local fishermen disposed of their spoils of the sea to the wholesale merchants, who in turn sold their fish mainly in the Canadian markets. The industry was a large one, and for some time the practice was carried on Hampton Beach presenting a most active appearance during the fall and winter months. Then the men from the three states would return after selling their cattle, but they had to bring something back, so what they brought back was the frozen fish. See why they came during the winter? It's because that fish, fish would spoil. So the fishermen had an, an, an excellent market. Your market was always local. Then from here, from the fish houses themselves, they would have to move the fish in some type of container and they would lay down some ice or um, some type of salting system and move it to the places where people expected to find it. They would sell to their farmer friends. Uh, they might be going along on the, a slow moving carriage with a horse and say fish for sale fresh fish right off our beach. And I imagine that that paid enough that uh, the people had the dories and had a living. As for Moses Levitt, after his death in 1846, his son and grandsons expanded the one-story house into a substantial inn 
taking in boarders to accommodate the growing summer tourists to Hampton, New Hampshire. Levitt's Boarding House became a famous vacation place for more than a century and contributed to Hampton as a summer resort. When the Europeans first arrived in the 1500s, lobsters were plentiful, but not a desirable food. The only people who ate lobster were poor families and indentured servants. These fisher folk did not uh, go for lobsters. You know why? They were called mud roaches. Uh, and uh, prisoners, in fact, that's what they, they uh, gave the prisoners, because no one else would, would actually touch them. During the early to mid 1800s, lobster fishing was done simply by collecting lobsters that had washed up on the beach or had been stuck in tidal pools when the tide went out. These beaches being looking like windrows, which is a, a way you describe fields of wheat. When the wheat's been collected, they, it comes in windrows. And the windrows on this beach were lobsters. Lobsters and seaweed and crabs and, 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 and everything rotting, just putting up a heck of a stink. Many of the, of the what we call upcountry farmers bring a wagon with two horses to this beach and at, you know, just past these rocks and the fish houses and um, take um, old bushel uh, baskets off and come down and scoop up that lobster rotting lobster and seaweed and everything else with uh, pitchforks. Put them in the bushels, take them, you know, fill two bushel things, take them back up to the wagon, dump them in and go back. A whole day's worth of uh, harvesting what then would not go on a regular field, I'm told, in a farmer's land, but because it was so nutrient rich, it might go in the farmer's garden. And depending on how much you wanted to drag, you couldn't you know, do fields with this thing, but you could definitely make a lovely stinky garden. And then as that stuff rotted on his beautiful garden, up came the freshest, you know, the special things he wanted to have, the herbs and the, the lettuce, whatever was you know, kept close to the farmer's uh, house. And could you see walking by a garden today with 10 or 15 lobsters they use as fertilizer? No way. In fact, I don't know how much uh, the West Coast pays per pound now for our lobsters. Oh. By the way, I have a wife that would kill for lobster. <laughs> it was only in the later 1800s that lobsters were harvested and used. Like fishing, lobstering was a rugged job. So at first light, these guys are out. And you'll notice that if you spend a lot of time with the sea, that the wind comes up. Almost every day, the wind comes up. When does it come up? Well, it might come up at 8, might come up at 6, might come up at 9. That you can't predict. You can predict it will come up, and you can predict that it will be calm before it comes up. And that's all you can predict. Opening the front doors of their fish shacks, lobstermen loaded their dories for the early morning trip. They would take these dories and um, roll them out and then roll them down, there was no rocks here, and roll them on um, to the beach and at high tide they would go fishing because low tide here is another 200 yards. So you don't want to push the dory and do that 200 yards. And then what they would do is shove off from the rear, uh, hop on the boat and stand up. We all think when you get into a rowboat that you turn backwards. But these guys were turned around and they are going like this to propel themselves forward. It's just counterintuitive. None of us have learned to do this. And the last two guys who lobstered here that my dad knew, um, Oliver Henkel and Elias T. Card, were both guys who rode their dories, standing up, facing forward, going out through the waves. Lobstermen rode from one trap to the next. They would remove any lobsters, and then rebate if necessary. And when you haul lobster traps by hand, you're getting a workout because there's no machine that you put the line on and the machine pulls it up. You actually haul it. And it's weighted 
the wrong way. It's not weighted for buoyancy to rise. It's weighted to sink and stay on the bottom of the floor, uh, the ocean floor, because that's where the lobsters are. And oh, inside the lobster trap are bricks. In the old days, just four bricks, four corners, that sank your thing. Bricks were cheap, you put them in there, uh, they fit in the corners. When hauling lobster traps, a slight miscalculation could end in disaster. Thomas Levitt wrote, It was way back in 1843 or 4 in July. It was a calm, bright morning, and such a one, I do believe, as is never seen, felt, and enjoyed anywhere in the wide world away from Boar's Head. The shower house stood over against the side of the bluff, a little further up than the hotel, and sleepy David, the hosteler, stood on top of it working, where there reached his ears, borne across the water, the agonized cry of a man in mortal peril and fear. David ran for the house and into the hall, shouting at the top of his voice, man overboard, man overboard. Then turning their glaze in the direction in which David was pointing, the people saw far off over the water against the point a boat bottom up and a man's head, a pitiable sight, and it stirred their hearts. The woman wrung their hands and moaned. The men became greatly excited, ran up the side of the bluff, shouting to the poor fellow in the water to hold on. At last the rescuing boat reached the drowning man, and the excited people had the unspeakable joy of seeing him on board and safe. When he landed, it was noticed that he had on but one shoe, on being inquired of about, he told this story to the wondering company. He had gone out to draw a lobster trap and catch a lobster. In raising the trap, he had to lean back and pull. And just at that time, his feet slipped and he fell on his back and side onto one side of the boat, pulling the trap after him, causing the boat to keel over and the trap to come right across his breast. He sank to the bottom with the trap on top of him and his struggle to get from under it, he somehow got his foot between the rods of the trap and was anchored. To get clear, he pulled his foot out of his shoe, then rose to the top of the sea. Someone expressed a doubt as to the accuracy of his statement about his entanglement with the trap at the bottom. He looked at the doubter, then calmly drew from his pocket a soaked wallet that looked as though it had been subjected to pressure, and said there was a $5 bill in there and that he would bet it with him or any other man in the company that they would find his shoe and a lobster too in the trap. A man was sent and the trap was brought ashore. And sure enough, there was found in it to the discomfiture of the doubter and the joy of all the others, his shoe and a lobster. In the late 1800s, the demand for lobster along the New Hampshire seacoast area had increased. Yet lobstermen were not always able to sell their entire catch, resulting in lost profit. By 1900, lobstermen had found an answer to leftover live lobsters. Some lobstermen had a live car in which to hold the lobsters until they could be sold. What the fishermen did is they built, we call them cars. Uh, some of the old fishermen may have different names for them. Harold Mace had one. Uh, his was probably, oh, 20 feet by 20 feet, though they were oh, four or five feet deep. All made of wood, and they were made so that they could take smaller crates or just lobsters and put them in to hold them. So they come in from the day's fishing, they pull their boat up to the car, right? If they were crating the lobsters, they'd, they'd put them in small crates. 100 pounds is usually what you got in a crate. Right? And they'd take and they'd open up the, the scow or the, or the car and they'd slide the crates right in. And they'd close it and lock it up. And, but that's how they stored them until they got ready to sell them between Christmas and New Year's because that used to be the big price jump. And, but that doesn't happen anymore so they don't, uh, they don't do it anymore. Lobster cars were utilized in New Hampshire into the mid-1900s. Shortly after 1900, many ordinances and regulations were passed by both the New Hampshire and federal governments that greatly affected the fishing, lobstering, and clamming industries along the New Hampshire seacoast. Mm -hmm. 
1908, there was a growing concern about the overdigging of clams on the Seabrook and Hampton Flats. Over the years in the town of Hampton, they passed a lot of ordinances, and Seabrook passed the same thing, trying to control the amount of clams that were dug, uh, thinking if they could do that, they could, they could keep the industry going. But even when the state took over the clam flats in the 50s uh, and stopped the commercial digging, uh, the clams still disappeared and suddenly they would come back again. And I, I don't think anybody really knows the reason why those things happened. It used to be real easy to dig a bucket of clams. You know, when I was a kid, you could dig a bucket of clams in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and not have to travel very far. But clams are pretty scarce in Hampton Harbor now. Throughout the years, regulatory laws have been passed to conserve the clam flats. Digging is allowed during specific hours, days, and months throughout the year. A clam digger must possess authorized equipment and are restricted to the number of clams taken from the Seabrook and Hampton Flats. By 1900, there was also a suspected shortage of lobsters along the New Hampshire coast. Like the clamming industry, ordinances were passed to protect what are known as shot lobsters. Lobster fisherman has a gauge and it goes from the eyepiece to the, to the end of the body just before the tail and it has to be three odd inches long. And if it's shorter than that, that's a short lobster that's supposed to throw it back. And so that lobster ultimately sheds its shell a few times and becomes larger and then they can take the lobster. Uh, but some people would thought, well, you know, I'm not gonna throw these away. I spent a lot of money coming out here. I've got all these traps, I've got bait. I've got somebody helping me perhaps, I've got fuel, I've had to pay for traps. I'm going to just, you know, that's close enough, I'll keep it. And essentially what they were doing was wiping out the supply of the younger lobsters. Lobstermen ignored the shot lobster law and in July of 1904, the New Hampshire State Fish and Game Commissioner Clerk raided Hampton River and the fish houses in search of less than legal length lobsters. Fights, arrests, and threats with shotguns ensued. In 1914, more arrests occurred. The topic of shots continued to cause friction between authorities and lobstermen, while the number of lobsters in the Hampton Seabrook Harbor has declined during the past century. There were people back then uh, in the 50s that, and even in the early 70s, that made a living out of Hampton Harbor catching lobsters and never left the harbor. And you can't, barely can catch a lobster there now. To protect the lobster population from being wiped out, both New Hampshire and the federal government continued to pass ordinances and regulations. Restrictions include the time of day for lobstering, the number of lobsters that may be taken on a given trip, the number of traps used, and the illegal possession of egg-bearing females. Things have definitely changed. You know, now you're required to have um, fish and game tags on your on every trap, and your name and phone number of the lobsterman on the trap to identify it. You're required to have in the wire traps escape vents for the little creatures that might get in there, other than lobsters or the small lobsters, to go in and out. You're required to have a breakaway on. Um, between the, between the uh, trap and the buoy, so that if a right whale gets caught it, in your trawl or your line, the line will part and the whale won't get caught in it. So there are a lot of things that are different. At one time, cod and other fish were abundant off the New Hampshire seacoast. However, by the latter half of the 20th century, there was a concern over the lack of fish found along the shore. When is the last time somebody around here caught a 120 pound codfish? I mean, there aren't any more. There's no codfish anymore in shore. The codfish don't come here. The pollock don't come in. Coastal development and overfishing were some explanations for the shortage of fish stock. Another problem was competition from European fishing fleets. American fishermen pressured the U.S. Congress for assistance, and in 1976, Congress passed the Magnuson-Stevens Act, 
of the Fishery Conservation Management Act of 1976. Part of this act forced foreign fishing vessels to stay at least 200 miles off the United States coastline. They passed the Magnuson Act and that was, basically it was what we call a deal with the devil. We, we got the 200 mile limit and in return we accepted fisheries management by the United States government. And at, at first it wasn't a bad deal. Foreigners got pushed out, fish started coming back. What helped the local fishing industry was the, the, uh, the installation of the 200 mile limit. And everybody was quite pleased with that because you wouldn't have the Germans and the Russians and the Poles and whoever else taking our fish. So as the end result, we went out and took our fish and cleaned up all of our fish. Uh, we overfished it as bad as those foreign fleets were doing. With the Magnuson-Stevens Act, Congress removed foreign competition, yet reserved the power to continue to create laws, regulations, and ordinances to protect the fish stock. Since the uh, creation of the Magnuson Act, there have been 17 amendments and 47 frameworks. Every one of these is incredibly controversial. This business has been destroyed by overzealous regulation, in my opinion. I remember hearing someone saying that I used to be able to fish for 230 days, and then they cut that by 20%, then they cut that in half. So they were saying, you know, I can only fish for 45 days. The result is that we're landing a lot less fish than, than we used to land. It doesn't mean there's less fish out there, it just means we're just not allowed to fish as much. And we certainly needed to constrain the number of people we had doing this, but we have to find a way to, we have to find a way to balance the needs of the fish and the needs of the fishermen. If we do everything for the fish and nothing for the fishermen, you'll have no fishermen. Conversely, if we do everything for the fishermen and nothing for the fish, you'll have no fish. So there has to be a balance in there somewhere. And that's very difficult to create legislatively. There's a it's a debate. It's a, it's a serious debate. Um, certain, fa certain factions say, you know, we've, we've got plenty of fish and there should be no need for regulatory uh, measures and so on and so forth. We've always fished and we've, there's always been plenty of fish and you tell us that there aren't any fish, but we know there are more fish out there. And, and there are the other side of the spectrum or the other side of, of the argument says, well, we're going to lose it all if we, if we, uh, if we don't regulate. And it's an ongoing argument. It's a very emotional argument. Until these regulations are made a little more reasonable uh, and a little more balance is provided, um, you know, like I said, they, they are going to exterminate the ground fish fishery here in New Hampshire. The 1907 Hampton census listed only 12 fishermen. These fishermen were the last to use the fish houses at North Beach Cove. Many of the houses fell into disarray or were converted into cottages. This sparked a debate that would connect back hundreds of years to the original agreement between Hampton and the fishermen who wanted to build fish houses. Now remember I said as long as they were using the fish houses for livelihood from the sea, they were permitted to stay here and have a tax-free uh, fish house. Uh, many of the families of the fishermen at uh, the fish house area found that uh, because their fathers and grandfathers weren't fishing, they began to redo the houses for recreational purposes. They put on a screen porch so they could sit out there during the summer. And uh, all of a sudden, the selectmen discovered that it was no longer being used for the purpose for which it was intended. For the next nine years, the fish house case was in and out of court. Finally, in 1959, the New Hampshire Supreme Court made a final ruling on the future of the fish houses at North Beach Cove. The Supreme Court in 1959 said
these houses, if not being used for fishing purposes, had to go. The court determined that two of the remaining fish houses in 1959 could remain because they were being used full time by their owners for fishing purposes and fulfilled the 1638 obligation. So that we have now those two fish houses remaining. Neither one is used for fishing. There, there's only uh, like, I'm gonna say maybe 15 fish houses on the coast. There's 10 here and there's three in Rye and maybe two in Hampton. Um, and so, you know, that's all we got of this, you know, and pretty soon some of this will be gone as things do pass on. Ever since I've been a child, I've been a local history buff of this place. I just, I just love this area. It's got so much history. Here we start with the 1600s, or if you go to the Alza Shoals, you can start with the late 1500s, and, and fishermen being out there fishing from Europe. So, and now they're doing archaeological digs at the shoals that so show that Native Americans were out there. This was an efficient working part of our seacoast, and that this is where we come from. We just didn't show up here one day that there was a reason why people came here, and a lot of it was these same natural resources which, which we've uh, sort of over, overused now, and some of them are, are, are in danger of going away all together. So if we know the history, and if we know what was important to the people that first came here, then we can think back, what do we want to, what do we want to see in the future? Do we still want to be able to clam? Do we still want to be able to go out and get fish? Do we still want to be able to have lobsters? Uh, if we do that, we have to see how they handle it in the, in, in the past. And people were concerned in the past about these things. It's our heritage, and if we don't know from whence we came, we don't know where we're going. And another thing, just to appreciate. I'm a retired teacher, and I've taught grades from kindergarten through grade seven. I'm just fascinated with local history and I've tried, no matter what grade I was teaching, to have children be fascinated with it too because if you, if you develop people who are as young, who cherish their local environment and their heritage, then when they grow older they'll take care of it too.